turn to uh, Andy King, uh, who's going to discuss some turnout control for us. And uh, Andrew, I really do appreciate you uh, coming this evening and uh, looking forward to this. Thank you. Get myself unmuted here. Oh, you're more than welcome, Jim. I'm always happy to do this. Unmute myself, I guess I have. Okay, uh, let me pull up my, let's see, share screen. You know, construction techniques. Here we go. Okay, I'm going to cover a, a few techniques that I've learned uh, as I've been building the Nashville Road. And um, there are always, uh, it's always possible I'll make some modifications as I work with them. And you'll see tonight that I've made a few modifications as uh, things went along here. So, first of all, uh, just uh, none of this is going to be in depth. It's going to show you basically what I do and how I do it. But um, if anybody has questions or anything, uh, please free to jump in and uh, you can always contact me if you have questions. I'm always um, happy to help whoever I can. Okay, um, I use Atlas Code 83 Flex uh, for just about everything. I used 100 in staging. I used a lot of Atlas uh, Code 83 switches and I've slowly been upgrading them to uh, fast tracks by modifying the Atlas and, and I'll cover that uh, a little bit uh, here in a bit. I use a cork road bed. Um, I, have a, I had a 125 foot roll, four foot wide and I cut all my own strips. And uh, let's see, give you some installation ideas and also super elevating the curves. So, um, Basically, when I uh, lay track, uh, I like to use uh, a small putty knife like this for the Alex Plus DAP caulk. And everything that I've been laying has been with this product, a uh, paper thin layer of it, and it's worked out great. Track has adhered very well. Um, both the track that's been ballasted and, and that that has, I only had a couple of spots where um, they popped out. Um, because of the, in the curves uh, with the contraction expansion problem. Uh, I like to use a uh, four or five foot um, straight edge and I butt that against the, um, the track, the rail head uh, to make sure it's good and straight. And then I use the, um, I got a brain fart, the caliper to um, get good separation between tracks, a constant separation. So we'll go over this. Okay, uh, when I laid the track um, with the caulk, uh, you can see it's paper thin. I just drop the track down into it. And if I, if I use a uh, cork first, then I go ahead and uh, apply the cork, uh, same way, let it dry well. And then I apply the track right over it. The, let's see, okay. Um, the first track I lay down, uh, and if you look at the one closest to the fascia here by my hand, uh, I lay that first using a straight edge to, uh, I, I'll use a long string actually, uh, like in the yard when you've got uh, 14, 15 foot long tracks, I'll snap a string or I will uh, run a really tight string from one end to the other on the center line and then use a pencil and just mark it every foot or so where the string is. Then I'll come back with a straight edge and mark the line. So I've got a line all the way down that I will keep the track centered on. Uh, once that's in and I use the, let me go to the next picture here. Uh, you can see how I butted this up against the uh, railhead. And that allows me to make uh, small adjustments and keep the track all, uh, all in line and I'd use the caliper uh, to check it every so often just to make sure the track isn't coming a little closer or going further away uh, and I can make adjustments. And then uh, once that's done, then I go ahead and I put weight down on the uh, track and let it dry. Um, something I've, I've used uh, that's worked well, uh, I see some people have problems uh, at the uh, rail joints. Uh, with the ties. Uh, sometimes I just see ballast filled in here. 
but what I've done uh, is um, taken some extra ties that I've had. I trim them down a little, take the, uh, the uh, spike heads off. I slide them under the rail. And then I take my soldering uh, iron and I push down, just kind of put it on the top of the rail and push down until it starts to, well, let me go back one here, uh, until it starts to um, melt into the top of the tie. You, you don't want to do it too long or the ends start to bow up as they, as they get too hot. But you'll, you'll take the hump right out of here. If you don't do that, then everywhere you have rail joiners uh, and you've got these under the rail joiners, uh, you're going to have a little hump. Um, so that's worked well for me. And once you get the, um, the uh, ballast down in that, you don't see this. It's all constant, works out nicely. Uh, on this uh, picture right here is uh, the cork. Uh, I uh, transition it down to uh, the deck. All my yards, uh, sidings and such um, are on right on plywood. Uh, I only put the main line on cork. And um, I would use a shear form tool. Sometimes, depending on the length, I might use a belt sander just carefully. And I just, uh, just trim it down, taper it down. And then uh, when it looks good to me, I go ahead and just glue the track in. Okay, super elevation. Uh, I, I've been using something else lately, but um, this is um, a weed whacker cord um, and I think it's around 60 thousandths or so. And I would uh, glue that down with AC uh, ahead of time. And then once it's uh, glued and it's in place, I, I put a little weight on it to keep it down if, if need be. But then I go ahead and I run cork uh, across the, um, I'm sorry, I run caulk across the cork all the way along and then just lay the track into it, get the track situated the way I want it and then put weight down. And it dries uh, with the super elevation in it and it's worked out well for me. Here's another one going into it. You have to excuse some of these pictures. They're older uh, pictures that I took when I was working. You can see the super elevation here. And again, here, a little bit better picture. No super elevation up here. This was uh, going into a, a switching area. Um, so it does, it does show and it really looks good when the trains are taking these curves. Okay, next uh, switches. Um, fast track switches, first of all, and then the Atlas upgrades. And um, for those that aren't familiar with the fast tracks, I, I know a lot of you are, uh, you can buy all these different jigs. This one is an actual jig for making number sixes, lefts and rights. Uh, this is one for getting the, uh, the angle frog right here. And there's seven, eight, and nine. I can make all three uh, angles. I can, I'll show you why I needed this. Uh, there's um, a point tool. Um, uh, for this, let's see, number eight and this point tool for number six. And this is a stock aid. And where this helps is where on the stock rail, where the uh, point rail comes up against the, uh, the, the outside or stock rail, uh, that needs to be um, flattened out at the base or the, uh, the point rail won't uh, tie into the stock rail uh, nice and smoothly. So. These are all good to have. So uh, with the uh, fast track switches, you can buy these um, uh, quick sticks, they call them. And uh, these come out for me because that's, that's what I use for uh, the copper clad ties. And you'll see where we use those. But these uh, come in frets of, forget how many are on there. 20 something, I forget, but uh, they are really handy to, to work with. So uh, we have a question in the chat uh, yes. from the transition from tangent track to super elevated curves. How do you do that? Um, I do it by eye and um, I just, I use a hand sander. If you use a belt sander, you gotta be very careful because of the heat. Um, but, oh, I did, I did say that I changed it. I don't use the weed whacker uh, cable now. What I use is this thin 
plastic and uh, I'll cut it and strip maybe uh, a foot, two feet long, as long as you need it. And um, slowly taper it up. So the first one will start at, at the zero point. The next one might start two inches or three inches in. The third one might start, uh, you know, six inches in. Uh, and you just use those to get the taper. Uh, I hope that makes sense. Uh, just you do it just for uh, the look. There, there's, uh, how do I want to put it? Model railroads uh, really don't need super elevation and they can cause problems if you do too much of a super elevation. Um, it can pull the cars into the curb, roll them off the uh, track. So that's basically just what looks good. You want to lead into it nice, uh, nice and slowly uh, and then uh, keep uh, the full amount all the way around the curve and then slowly uh, come out of it same way. I hope that makes sense. So um, here's a fast track switch. And I think I've got a couple of pictures of uh, a bunch of switches I replaced in the yard. So the copper clad ties, and you can see where you have to do your little slice on the copper cladding so you don't have any shorts. This rail, I should say this rail and this rail don't short, or this one and this one don't short. Um, there's no, these flex, they aren't uh, pivot points, which are really nice, I really like them. Now, go to the next one here. Okay, so this yard, these were all uh, Atlas number sixes. Uh, and I think there was close to, I don't know if it's 29 switches, something like that. Uh, and I just replaced them all with uh, the uh, fast track switches. Now, um, when I got done, of course, I've, I've got a lot more railroad to, to, uh, to lay up. And um, I had all these number sixes, uh, Atlas, and, and I wasn't going to throw them away and I wouldn't get a whole lot of money for them. So I played around with them and I, and I wanted to see if I could um, make them closer to uh, a fast track switch as far as the quality. So here's one more shot looking down. This is the local yard right here. The arrival uh, tracks down in tier to uh, three arrival departure, then the main class yard. And then uh, like I say, local, anything being delivered locally uh, comes in one of these tracks. Okay, so here's the first Atlas that I tried. And um, I had to get rid of uh, where the old Atlas frog was. I had to get rid of the frog, uh, the, the center tracks and the frog and these trailing tracks, they, they were all removed. Uh, and um, I saved what plastic ties I could save. And uh, I just used the copper clad ties to hold the two stock rails in place. And then I built a little fast. And then I built up this portion right here and just dropped it into place on the Atlas number six and soldered it to these copper clad ties. So uh, here's, here's uh, number eight that I pulled out of my passenger station. And you can see the big ugly frog here. Uh, one, it's ugly and two, uh, it's a very big uh, area uh, that gets no um, power uh, because my frogs are dead. So um, I wanted to uh, make these a little bit uh, more user friendly uh, when you're running around with a switcher, slowly moving past your cars around. I hate them having died on the uh, frog. So. Right here, you can see these are the areas that I had to pull off the, the number eight switch, the Atlas. These are the ties, uh, plastic ones that I could save. The copper clad ties that I put in place and uh, right on down. So now this was ready for me to make a new section, this section right here. And uh, I hand built this, I didn't have a jig. I, I have since bought a jig so I can make them faster. But um, that uh, was then placed in, in this area, soldered to these rails, and this is what it looked like here. And since I took the track out and I marked where it came from, and I didn't damage any track at either end, I was able to uh, lay these right back in place. The throw bar was in the same location, so that helped with the, uh, with the switch, switch machine that worked, that uh, 
I use to throw the uh, throw bar of the switch. Okay, fascia mounted ground throws. Uh, this is um, what I was actually going to talk about tonight. And I just added the other two with uh, Jim's blessing there. And um, I had a lot of fascia mounted ground throws uh, mounted at switches. One yard's got 60 something switches. The other one had, it's somewhere in the 50 uh, area. And then I've got different towns, industrial areas. And I've slowly been modifying all of them and bringing the fascia mounted ground throws uh, or, or applying fascia mounted ground throws, which makes it a lot nicer for the area around the switches. You don't have people leaning in and, and playing with them. You don't have an oversized black plastic switch machine or a throw sitting by the switch. So um, this is what uh, basically I did and I'll show you how I did it. Ground throws are mounted on a little, uh, one by two board on the fascia. And um, we'll take this switch right here. Uh, at, at this time, I had a ground throw sitting right here and we're going to modify it. So first of all, what I did was uh, mark the, the alignment of the throw bar. And then I put a dot on each side. Uh, it would be equidistant from the center of the throw bar. And you'll see why after I pick this up. So this is what I've got now. Now I want to drill two holes and then I elongate the hole. So I use, and if somebody knows the name of this cutter, uh, let me know, but I, I call it a side cutter. It's a, it's a drill. It'll drill down in, then you can use it to cut sideways. So I, I, I cut the original hole with this one, then I use this one to elongate the, this was a two holes side by side, then this elongates them. And you can see the two holes side by side. And then I use this to, to open it up. And I like to come in at an angle here because you'll see when I, when I put the uh, aluminum tube in here, I like to have it hanging out over in the open and that way you can't get any ballast, glue, any, anything uh, up in there and jamming the, the rod from working within inside the tube. So this is what it looks like when it's done. Now I, I run a line out just with a magic marker to the fascia. And if something was in the way here, you could you can actually bend it and have it come out at an angle. Uh, if you have two switches really close, you can have one come a little bit one way, one little bit the other way, and then uh, mount your ground throws far enough apart. So, um, anyways, you cut you you uh, mark the slot, and then uh, early on, I was cutting it with a with the um, a box cutter. And if it's, if it's kind of soft plywood, this was pretty easy. Some wasn't so easy, but this was, I, I was able to make the uh, V slot. And then once I cleaned it out and that, now the aluminum tube can lay in there. Now you want a hole coming in from the, uh, from the fascia uh, in line with the, um, the top of the drill should be just in line with the, uh, the top of the plywood so the tube will lay in here flat. Push the tube in place and I do like to use aluminum. Um, I've got these specs on these uh, a little further in but the uh, I like the aluminum better than the brass. It bends easier and it's it's cheaper. It's easier to, to get three foot sections. I, I buy some of these at the hardware that uh, come in three foot. Hobby shops are kind of few and far between these days so um, so anyways, you want the aluminum just hanging out over the, uh, or I should say the tube hanging out over the open area here. Like that. I used uh, track spikes. Uh, I no longer do that. What I use now is just hot glue. And then once it sets up, then I just kind of uh, smooth it out, uh, you know, sand it or cut it with a knife just to level it with the uh, plywood so it won't affect the scenery above it. Then I cut the tube off uh, just a short distance out from the fascia, uh, an eighth or a 16th of an inch. I, I don't really measure it. I just, what looks good to me. You see it down here. What's so the diameter of the tube? Pardon me? 
What's the diameter of the tube? Uh, I've got that spec. I'll I'll give it to you in a, in a minute. It's on a sheet. It's on one of the pages. All right. Thank you. Yep. You're welcome. Um, so now we're ready to put the wire in. So, and this wire is also a heavier wire than I use now. I was using a heavier wire, but um, the the lighter wire uh, seems to work a lot easier. It's easier to work with, easier to cut. So you put a, a 90 and you can make it as big as you want because you're gonna cut it down to size once it's in the, uh, uh, in the throw. Now you push it in from this end out to the fascia. And uh, here's the wiring coming out and then just, just work it back and forth to make sure it, it works all right. There's the wire, a 90 degree sticking up. Now uh, the switch, and you see this is a pretty beat up switch too. This, this switch is long gone, but um, the switch um, was laid down over the, uh, the wire and you can see it's right back in place. And the, the tube is hidden under here so it won't affect anything. Now um, I'll show you a little bit later how to make these. <clears throat> You just mount a ground throw on it. And here I spiked them. Uh, but now um, uh, a good friend of mine, Ron St. Laurent, he found uh, it's a um, uh, cigar box banjo, I think it is. But they have super small screws that fit just perfect for this, this uh, job here. There may be a, a quarter inch, maybe a little bit longer than a quarter inch. Maybe that's a little too short, but they're very, very small. And I use those now. I just drill a little hole uh, where I want the um, I want to be mounted, and then use the screw. Okay, uh, Cedar Hill Yard was a, a yard I rebuilt. Um, this uh, you can see where all the ground throws were, so they're all uh, out there. It was operational. Um, but I, I wanted to do some scenery work here, so I wasn't going to be able to do it until I did some work with the ground throw. So I removed everything. I marked down where the switches were. Well, you can see where the switches were, the, uh, the different locations. I marked them. <clears throat> then I went ahead. I, I used the roto zip for a while. I don't use it now, but I used that for a while. Uh, and it, it was okay. It, it worked all right. Um, but uh, I think the next picture will show you uh, what I'm using now. Now this board here, this would sit down so the fascia would be sitting in this slot. So it would be vertical and this would sit down over it. So this was sitting right flush on the plywood. So the bottom of this was exactly where you wanted the top of the drill hole. So I just, I'd set that in place I'd mark a little line, a pencil line, and then when I drilled it, I drilled it right at just below the, the pencil line, and it worked out good. And uh, down in here against the fascia, you'd have to clean that up by hand with, uh, you know, with a, a knife, but it, it really didn't work that badly. Okay, the next, uh, here's what I use now, and this is a, a trim router, um, is somewhere around 30 bucks at uh, Harbor Freight. My dog wants me to play Frisbee with him. Nobody. Cool. And um, Harbor Freight, uh, we got these, uh, two or three of us got them, and they work out really well. You just put a router uh, bit in there, and it cuts a slot. So I have all these slots uh, in place. Now it's a matter of just laying up all the tubes. You see, I got a little bit of a curve on this one. No, no, go lay down. Go on. Uh, these, uh, these are all in the, this, this dog is ball and frisbee crazy. That's all he wants to do. Um, so all these tubes uh, I got in place and I can see it in the next picture right here. You can see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, uh, another one down here. So once I got those all in, then I just had to start dropping the switches back down on top of them. Um, here's a short or a, a close up. Okay, switches are all back in place. Got the wires all out. And now um, 
these uh, I buy these at Menards. I can get it anywhere. Uh, one by two with no knots, nice and straight. And no, go lay down. And um, I use a pop can or something, whatever you want on, on the corners and then just mark with a pencil, uh, cut it out and then just sand it uh, to, to get the, uh, you know, get the finish you would like. And then um, I use this drill, I a three and a half inch uh, screw and this countersink and basic, Basically, the uh, screw. Uh, you, my, this guy's something else. Um, the, the you drill a hole down through the uh, block, then you countersink it, and then you would go ahead and I I would prime it and then paint it, and then the the screw would go uh into the middle of this uh, you know through the fascia into the middle of this three quarter inch plywood and it's very very sturdy so one screw is fine for you also see the pencil lines that i made with that other block that i was telling you about right on top of the uh where the tubes are uh and then the longer ones you know if you need a couple more screws uh, then that would work and then you would just you'd fill it in i just use lightweight spackle sand it down a little and then give another coat of paint, which you don't see here. Um, then you mount your ground, uh, ground throws. So um, hard to reach switches, uh, reach switches. Um, I wasn't quite sure what to do at first with them. Uh, I thought I was gonna have to put the ground throws up by the switch, uh, but it turned out that um, I've got some of this cable. Uh, if you're familiar with, um, Howard Humpyard Purveyance. Uh, the gentleman has passed now, and I understand the company's no more. But you can you can buy wire and tubes similar to this. Some of you probably know where we might get it. Um, but it's very uh, flexible. Put, Pardon me. Uh, I can put something in the chat. You can get that from model airplane suppliers. Oh, great. Okay, super. Thank you, TC. Um, the, the what what I did was I just brought it out. It'll be a hidden in scenery and around and down to the fascia here because this drops away. Uh, there's a roadway now that comes down and goes under the bridge. So um, that is one that worked out well for me. I had to use an O-scale um, uh, ground throw to, uh, to get it to lie, uh, throw enough, but once I replace this switch, uh, then I think, I think I won't have that problem. Uh, one thing I didn't point out the the, the last uh, Cedar Hill where where um, I just redid those switches, showing you there, I've it's all scenic, it's all finished, uh, and now uh, I've decided to rebuild the actual switches. So I got to rip it all up again and rebuild those switches. But it's going to be the last place I'm going to do if I live that long because I've got a lot of others to do. So. Here's another point uh, where this ground throw is gonna be pretty hard to come down here. It kind of drops all the way down. Uh, same with these. What I can do is have it go to the back, angle down underneath and come out to the fascia here. And the same with these. These could be uh, brought back, make a, a, a 180. Well, actually it'd be um, yeah, 180 from the back out to here. So there's all, all kinds of ways of getting these done. Uh, there's some more up here at the Ford plant. So um, I haven't done them yet, but I know they can be done. And um, with that cable, you know, the tube and, and wire, uh, the yellow stuff you saw, it's, uh, it's really gonna be helpful. Okay, tube, uh, it's K and S, it's 1108. It's three thirty seconds and three feet long. And then the KNS number 500 is 25,000 so three foot long music wire. And again, you don't want the, the wire tight in the tube. You want a lot of slop. So if you get something in there, I bound up some of them, the first ones I did, and I had to rip them out and redo them because I had them too tight. So if, um, oh, okay, pass your terminal switches. Uh, and I am in the process of uh, modifying these too. But uh, basically, these are the, the uh, Howard Humpyard Purveyance um, uh, Armstrong switches. 
And these go underneath the uh, layout to the different switches in the passenger station. I got one of these at, at each end of the uh, passenger terminal. Now here they are here and you can see them coming out and all going to the different switches. Well, what we're gonna do is um, take these and uh, remove uh, the, the tubes and wire, but I'm going to uh, put a switch up here. So you line it one way or you throw the Armstrong lever one way and uh, it'll, uh, the switch machine will throw the, um, the switch one direction or line it one direction. You pull it the other way and it will line it the other direction. So I just need to uh, have uh, the, um, the Armstrong lever work the, uh, the switch uh, left, right, uh, up on whatever you wanna call it to control the uh, slow motion switches that will be mounting on the, uh, the uh, tracks uh, at the passenger terminal. So uh, let's see. Okay, I think that's it. Now we're getting into a different area. So, um, oh, what, let, me, let me just look at one thing real quick here. Um, yeah, we, you were talking about the scenery, uh, the ballasting. Um, I'm sorry, the, the uh, weathering of the, the ties. And I used acrylic paints, uh, three or four different uh, colors. And um, I also used washes, and this was after I sprayed it with, um, with the uh, Rust-Oleum uh, dark brown um, camouflage. I, I didn't like Krylon. It, it didn't seem to be and it stunk more. So I stuck to, uh, to the, the Rust-Oleum, but they do the same thing. Uh, and then uh, what I did was because of the spike heads, you don't want them uh, really standing out, they're, they're big enough uh, as they are. I would paint from here in, uh, you know, from both directions in and then from here out. And what I do is I would take a, a certain color, say a light gray, and I'd hit two or three, go down here, one, another couple here and one, uh, and then I'd get the next color. And, and it sounds tedious, but it really goes fast. Uh, and then, you know, it does make, a, it does make a difference. I don't think I have any more pictures of that. Um, oh, these are, well, there's, there's another shot. So not to get completely into a different thing, but since they were talking about weathering and that, I just thought I'd show what I'd done. So that's basically it, Jim. I'll uh, stop here. I'm all set if you're all set. Well, Andy, I can't thank you enough. That's uh, fantastic information. And, and uh, I love the way that you, uh, you, you mount your, uh, your switch controllers. That's really interesting. Thank you so very much. Oh, thank you. I, I enjoy being part of your uh, program here. Well, I enjoy having you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>